Hello space fans and welcome to another edition of Space Fan News. This week it's all Kepler and K2. Did you know that Kepler is back in the exoplanet business? It's also doing a lot more than that. I was reminded early last week that the venerable Kepler Space Telescope has been back in business searching for exoplanets for a little more than two years. It was easy to forget because astronomers have been making amazing discoveries with the original data set ever since the failure of the reaction wheels in May of 2013. That data set has provided us with an astonishing 4,696 planet candidates and 1,959 confirmed exoplanets, with five just added yesterday. And yes, I call them St. Patty's Day planets. Now for those who don't know, or who may have forgotten, in May 2013, Kepler lost the second of its four reaction wheels that are necessary to keep it pointed precisely. In order to make the transit light curves that alert astronomers to a possible exoplanet candidate, the spacecraft must be pointed very, very carefully. It, luckily, it only had to point in one spot in the sky. No one is moving it around like its successor, TESS, will have to do, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. But still, it needs at least three reaction wheels to do it. Reaction wheels are these large, heavy, spinning, disc-like things that provide directional stability. They are sometimes called momentum wheels, and you need one for each pointing axis of the telescope. Well, when the second one failed, Kepler couldn't keep pointing at the same spot very accurately. So, after checking that all the systems were okay, they shut Kepler down to try to see what to do next putting the spacecraft and its detectors in what they called a thruster-controlled safe mode. And then they started thinking about what to do. To keep with its science mission of finding Earth-sized exoplanets, they needed that extra wheel or Kepler couldn't do its job. But they didn't have it anymore. And the fix they came up with was very clever. One for the Just Like Downtown archives. <laughs> Engineers at Ball Aerospace found that they could use pressure from the solar wind to keep Kepler stable. Now, to achieve the necessary stability, the, op the orientation of the spacecraft must be nearly parallel to, the, to its orbital path around the Sun, which is slightly offset from the ecliptic, which is the orbital plane of the Earth. The ecliptic plane is the band of sky where the constellations of the zodiac are. Now, the ecliptic is a fancy word for the path that the Sun, Moon, and planets follow across our sky. So this means that the spacecraft had to be moved and can't just keep staring at one part in the sky anymore. It will have to look at different regions, besides Cygnus, depending on where it is in its orbit around the Sun. Now they've divided each orbit of Kepler into approximately 4.5 unique viewing periods or campaigns, with each portion observed for up to 83 days, and they do it very precisely. And the solution worked brilliantly. K2 is back to finding exoplanets. So there you have it, space fans. Kepler is back, and they're calling it K2. It was born in May 2014, a year after the initial reaction wheel failure. Ever since the Ball Aerospace engineers who built Kepler came up with this ingenious solution, K2 has discovered more than three dozen exoplanets and has more than 250 planet candidates awaiting confirmation. A handful of these worlds are near Earth-sized and orbit stars that are bright and relatively nearby compared with Kepler discoveries, allowing scientists to perform follow-up studies. In fact, these exoplanets are likely future targets for the Hubble Space Telescope and for the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope, which has potential to study these planets' atmospheres in search of signs of life. Now, reminiscent of the last Hubble servicing mission, this ingenious solution kind of upgraded Kepler. Because it's pointing in different areas of the sky with the same stability, it can actually do more than just find tiny dips in brightness of 160,000 stars in one spot. In addition to just looking for Earth-sized planets, as Kepler was originally tasked to do, K2 is helping astronomers understand the evolution of planetary systems and environments around stars harboring planets. For example, in October 2015, K2 uncovered strong evidence of a tiny, rocky object being torn apart as it spirals around a white dwarf star. This discovery validates a long-held theory that white dwarfs are capable of cannibalizing possible remnant planets that have survived within its solar system. Exoplanets have long been thought to orbit these white dwarf stars, but not until K2 has the theory been confirmed. During its first observing campaign from May 30, 2014 to August 21, 2014, K2 trained its gaze on a patch of sky in the constellation Virgo, measuring the minuscule change in brightness of a distant white dwarf. 
A research team found an unusual but vaguely familiar pattern in the data. While there was a prominent dip in brightness occurring every four and a half hours, blocking up to 40% of the white dwarf's light, the transit signal of the tiny planet did not exhibit the typical symmetric U-shaped pattern shown here in red. Instead, they saw an asymmetric, elongated slope pattern that showed the presence of a comet-like tail. Together, these features indicated a ring of dusty debris circling the white dwarf, and what could be the signature of a small planet being vaporized. For the last decade, astronomers suspected that white dwarf stars were feeding on the remains of rocky objects, and this result may be the smoking gun they were looking for. But K2 is also teaching us a lot about stars. Mature stars, about the age of our sun or older, largely populated the original single Kepler field of view. In contrast, many K2 fields see stars still in the process of forming. And in these early days, planets are also being formed. And by looking at the timescales of star formation, scientists gain insight into how our own planet formed. Finally, and what I find incredibly cool, is that K2 can now look at the ecliptic plane Remember, that's the area of sky from where our perspective here on Earth anyway, the sun, moon, and all the planets travel across the sky. This appears that way to us because most of the bodies in the solar system orbit the sun in a relatively narrow plane or disk. Now because of the new geometry on how K2 can point, it can't help but look at the ecliptic and observe dynamics of our solar system. K2 is well equipped to observe small bodies within our own solar system such as comets, asteroids, dwarf planets, ice giants, and moons. Last year, for instance, K2 observed Neptune in a dance with its two moons, Triton and Nereid. This was followed by observations of Pluto and Uranus. Oh, and uh, one more thing. <laughs> They've redesigned the mission entirely. The original Kepler mission was organized along traditional lines of scientific missions, how most of them are, and it was designed to basically just answer one specific question on behalf of NASA, which was, how common or rare are Earths around other suns? Well, now they can answer a lot more than that, and so K2's modified mission involves a whole new approach, engaging the scientific community at large and opening up the spacecraft's capabilities to a broader audience. This means they're opening up K2 to be used a lot like Hubble, letting the scientific community decide what the most compelling science targets they should look at are, and that allows them to expand their science significantly. Now, the science community has full access to K2's observations and is using these data to make a wide range of unique discoveries across a full range of astrophysics phenomena. So K2 will study lots of different things with its new and expanded ecliptic field of view, including star clusters, young stars, supernovae, white dwarfs, very bright stars, active galaxies, and of course, exoplanets. K2 has more than two years worth of fuel remaining for its mission, and I'll make sure you get all the latest information from the space telescope that showed us there are on average 1.6 planets for every star in our Milky Way galaxy. Well, that's it for this week, space fans. Thanks to all my Patreon supporters for helping make SFN better. I promise you that a new camera is on the way, and thanks to all of you for watching. And as always, keep looking up.